Wrestling has had a lot of great gimmicks over the course of its history. You just have to look to the likes of Goldust, The Million Dollar Man, or of course The Undertaker for evidence of this. Hell, if you want to go back even further, you could even reach to the early days of the industry when Gorgeous George was on top and drawing the ire of fans everywhere as a great example of character work and action. That said, not every attempt to create the next big thing has been a winner as, in some unfortunate cases, these have ended up falling flat on their face, quite literally actually. So join us as we take a look at some of the worst to have ever existed in Failure to Launch, Wrestling's Biggest Failed Gimmicks. And since we already alluded to it in the intro, let's start off with one of the most infamous gimmicks in wrestling history, the Shockmaster. Yes, while he may have first found fame in 1980's WWF as Tugboat, and then later Typhoon, one half of the natural disasters, it wouldn't be until 1993 that Fred Ottman would create his Tommy Wiseau-level masterpiece when he debuted in World Championship Wrestling as his newest incarnation. And this incarnation, one which was supposed to be a major heel, would first appear during a segment when, hyping up his team's partner for their war games match that year, Sting would introduce a group of heels led by Sid Vicious to the Shockmaster. Unfortunately though, despite the company's attempts to make this introduction a memorable one, it would end up being memorable for all the wrong reasons when, upon bursting through the wall like the Kool-Aid Man, Ottman would trip on a rogue piece of wood, causing him to fall flat on his face as the British Bulldog could be heard off camera proclaiming, he fell on his arse. On top of this, to make matters worse, the Shockmaster's poorly made helmet, one which was basically just a Stormtrooper helmet spray painted with glitter, fell off his head at this point too, revealing to the world that this supposedly imposing force was just the former WWF mid-carter. But while some would have just ended things there and cut their losses, the Shockmaster powered through the embarrassment like a pro as, upon getting up and putting his helmet back on, he would continue on with his planned promo from there. Of course, the only problem with this was that it wasn't even Ottman's voice that was being used here. No, instead, he would be forced to point and mime badly as a poorly modulated Ole Anderson spoke over a loudspeaker, making the whole thing even more comical than it already was. So with the gimmick dead on arrival, WCW would do their best to salvage it in the weeks that followed by repackaging the big man as a klutz who continually made a fool of himself in a series of pre-recorded segments. Unfortunately though, despite being reasonably popular with live fans, the damage would have already been done by then and so a year later, the whole thing would be axed as Ottman spent a few more years working for various different companies, all before then creating a nice living for himself by playing up to the joke on the convention circuit. In fact, if you see him at a convention today, he'll likely have the infamous Shockmaster helmet with him, proving that, at the very least, he has a sense of humor about the whole situation. Of course, someone who didn't have a sense of humor about a failed gimmick of his would be Ottman's own nephew because when he was at one of his darkest moments of his life, Dustin Rhodes would jump over to Total Nonstop Action Wrestling, there trying and failing to get Black Rain over. And it wasn't for lack of effort on his part that this one failed because after leaving WWE and the Gold Dust gimmick behind, Dustin would try his best to channel his inner demons into what he described as a darker incarnation of the character one that would eschew all the glitz and glamour of the bizarre one and would instead show the more damaged side to the oldest Rhodes son. Unfortunately though, despite this sounding like a great idea on paper, in execution it turned out to be just an out of shape Dustin in what looked like a black garbage bag, with things being made even stranger by the rat he would often carry to the ring with him. Yes, it became clear pretty quickly that this one wasn't going to work out, but refusing to give up on it so early, the company would push on with things for a while yet anyway, as over the weeks and months that followed, Black Rain would find himself getting into feuds with the likes of Abyss and Raven, all while introducing a new partner in the form of Relic, that's killer spelled backwards. Once this failed to draw any interest, however, Black Rain would largely disappear from TV, with him eventually leaving the company altogether in 2008 as, from there, Dustin would get his life back on track and return to WWE to have something of a late career renaissance. So at least things were able to have a happy ending here then, even if we are unlikely to ever see Black Rain pop up over in AEW anytime soon. And as it happens, he's not the only failed character we won't be seeing showing up on that promotion because one of his colleagues, William Regal, seems only too happy to let his real man's man incarnation die a death and never be seen again. 
but of course this is partially because it came at a dark time during his life too, as it was right after the Englishman had been unceremoniously fired by WCW after, depending on who you believe, acting unprofessionally during a Goldberg match or doing exactly what he was told and trying to bring out a new side of him. Either way, the situation would end up with him being out of a job, and this meant that, now forced to seek employment elsewhere, Regal would jump over to WWF, where Vince Russo came up with a new gimmick for him, that being a real man's man who engaged in activities such as chopping wood, shaving with a straight razor, or squeezing his own orange juice. And as rumor has since had it, this was supposed to eventually lead to the reveal that, contrary to his overly masculine actions, Regal was actually a closeted homosexual, something we can only be glad never came to pass because, as history has shown us, WWE doesn't exactly have a deft touch when it comes to dealing with such issues in a respectful manner. Luckily then, things would never get a chance to get to this point, as before it could, Regal would part ways with the company after checking himself into rehab in early 1999, causing the whole angle to be quietly dropped. And while it's sad that it would take such personal problems to stop things from getting further awry on screen, at least the Englishman would be able to make a comeback in the years that followed, the same of which certainly can't be said for Glacier. Yes, moving back over to WCW for a second, we find an example of one of the biggest failed gimmicks ever, as despite it seeming obvious to everyone with eyeballs that this was never going to work, the plans of management had been to push Glacier hard and make him a big star upon his debut in 1996. And that was because, as part of a larger Blood Runs Cold storyline, WCW was hoping to capitalize on the success of Mortal Kombat by having Glacier appear as their equivalent of Sub-Zero, complete with a costume and mask which looks like it had been ripped straight out of the video game. On top of that, in a further effort to make the whole thing work, the new character would be given an elaborate entrance that saw him come out to a laser light show, something which allegedly cost nearly half a million dollars to produce. That said, after a lengthy build-up to his debut that saw the hype be built up to unmanageable levels, any magic which had been created would quickly dissipate as it became apparent that, with Raymond Lloyd, the man behind the gimmick, not exactly being Brian Danielson in the ring, and the whole thing looking outdated after the debut of the NWO, he was not going to be the star the company had hoped he would be. Still, with all that money sunk into the project already, WCW were hesitant to give up on it completely, so instead of just repackaging Lloyd, Glacier was kept as is and put into a mid-card program with another Mortal Kombat ripoff, that being Mortis, in the months that followed. Soon after that, and Wrath would be added to the whole thing too, between the three of them, the faux video game characters would go to war a number of times. Then, once that angle ran its course, Glacier would embark on a lengthy losing streak, which saw him do jobs to the likes of Steve Mongo McMichael, Lex Luger, Prince Iakea, and Perry Saturn, with the latter even leading to further embarrassment when Saturn lambasted the Mortal Kombat wannabe in the ring for his ridiculous look. So maybe it was for the best then that in early 1999, Lloyd was finally able to drop the gimmick once and for all and segue into something else when he kayfabe sold his ring gear to Ernest the Cat Miller and Kaz Hayashi, finally putting a closer on one of the limpest runs in WCW during that time period. Of course, it wasn't the limpest though because for as much of a failure as Glacier ended up being, he looked like a positive main event force when compared to the Kiss Demon. Yes, unsurprisingly, this one would come out of a business deal made by WCW and the band KISS during the late 90s, with the notoriously carny Gene Simmons at this time hoping to capitalize on the popularity of wrestling and bring his band back into the spotlight in the process. Unfortunately though, by then, most younger fans watching the show weren't interested in hair metal or glam rock anymore, and so when the Kiss Demon, played by journeyman performer Dale Torborg, made his debut under the new gimmick in mid-1998, they were quick to let their satisfaction be heard. But as it happened, Torborg was never supposed to be the man behind the makeup because initially it had been Brian Adams, the former crush, who had been pegged for the role. Realizing it was an albatross in waiting though, he'd turned this down, leading the company to have to go with a backup option instead. So doing what he could with it then, Torborg would be the next in line as, from there, he'd spend the next few months facing off against the likes of Vampiro in special main events that usually took place in the middle of the card. And the reason for this was that, as part of the deal WCW had made with KISS, any match the demon was in would have to be labeled a main event bout whether it was at the top of the card or not. But of course, that didn't really make a difference to the quality of things as, regardless of where he was placed on the card, the Kiss Demon would be unable to get over with fans. 
In fact, as it happened, his segments would regularly turn out to be some of the lowest rated in WCW history. So perhaps this was why, come early 2000, the whole thing would be retooled when, after Kiss had dropped out of the deal, the character would be renamed the Demon and put in a stable with Vampiro and the Insane Clown Posse. And following on from this, that was where he would remain, milling around in the undercard right up until the point that WWF bought the company out in early 2001. Of course, WWE couldn't take the high road when it came to laughing at bad gimmicks at this time, though, because as we've already shown, they had their fair share of them, too. And one of the most noteworthy of these in Vince McMahon's promotion would have happened a couple of years prior, as it was then that Mosh of the Headbangers was repackaged as Beaver Cleavage. God, where do we start with this one? Well, Beaver Cleavage was basically supposed to be a play on Leave It to Beaver, an old sitcom of the 1950s which followed the exploits of Theater Cleaver and his idealized suburban family. In Vince Russo era WWF, however, this would be twisted into something far weirder as, after being introduced through a series of black and white vignettes, Beaver would start showing up to the arena with his mother Mrs. Cleavage in tow. And while that all seemed innocent enough at first, pretty quickly things would get out of control when incestuous sexual innuendos started being shared between the two, such as the time Mrs. Cleavage offered her son some of her mother's milk for his cereal. Yes, this was approved by the same man who once wanted to be revealed as the kayfabe father of his daughter, Stephanie's baby, so maybe it shouldn't have come as a surprise that Vince McMahon would like this one. That said, though, it was not a sentiment which was shared by fans or Beaver Cleavage himself as, in a work shoot promo just a few weeks after the character was introduced, he'd apparently go off script and refuse to portray it any further, killing it stone dead as he then moved on to the far less controversial gimmick of someone who beat up his girlfriend. Not everything about the Attitude Arrow is good. But surely if we jump forward a few years to the Ruthless Aggression Era, we'll find that WWE learned their lesson when it came to incestuous characters. Well, not quite as it happened because, on SmackDown in the late 2000s, Paul Burchill would be stuck portraying a character that had an uncomfortably close relationship with his sister. And as it happened, the gimmick he had right before this wouldn't be much better as that was when he would portray pirate Paul Burchill. Of course, this was right around the time when Pirates of the Caribbean had become one of the biggest hit films in Hollywood, making stars out of Orlando Bloom and Kira Knightley, all while reviving the leading man career of Johnny Depp. And it was Depp's character, Captain Jack Sparrow, who would catch on particularly well with audiences as, with his rum-soaked, Keith Richards-inspired anti-hero nature, he became something of a pop culture icon and Halloween costume favorite for kids everywhere from then on in. So, hoping to capitalize on this, in 2006, WWE would separate one of their mid-card tag team acts at the time, Virtual and William Regal, and from there, repackage the former as someone who had been able to trace his ancestry back to the famous pirate, Blackbeard. And after that, armed with this new knowledge of his lineage, he would start coming out to the ring in full Jack Sparrow regalia, often swinging down the entrance ramp on a rope and taking on a more swashbuckling in-ring style as he quickly got into a program with his now former tag team partner. And this program would even see Birchall embarrass the Englishman when, upon beating him in a match, Regal would be forced to dress as a buxom wench, something which allowed him to play up to the pantomime style of comedy he'd mastered so well back in his home country. Unfortunately, though, one person who didn't seem to be a fan of the gimmick was Vince McMahon, as being someone who spent every waking minute of his day either working for WWE or working out at the gym wasn't as up-to-date on pop culture as others around him. So this allegedly left him with no idea who Jack Sparrow was or why pirates were suddenly in vogue again, leading to the character being scrapped soon after as Birchall was repackaged again, this time with his kayfabe sister Katie Lee, but let's not get any deeper into that angle. Yes, it wasn't the company's finest hour, but in truth, it wouldn't be the only time they'd try and fail to get a gimmick over around this period as, right as Paul Burchill was morphing into someone who was a little too close with his sister for comfort, Kizarni was making his own SmackDown debut. And this character, one who described himself as what would happen if Jake the Snake Roberts and Doink the Clown had a love child, was basically an excuse to make a joke about the coded language wrestlers would often use back in the day, with this being the holdover from its origins in the carnival circuit. Yes, Kizarni, basically wrestler speak for Carney, and would have been a word that was used by performers when kayfabe was still alive so as to not let fans in on what they were talking about. And that, as it happened, was pretty much the extent of the joke, with there being little more of note to the character. 
But even if the gimmick wasn't great, at least he got to show what he could do in the ring so as to try and counterbalance this, right? Well, no, as it happened, because after making a few dark match appearances, then briefly popping up on TV for both an elimination qualifier battle royale and a backstage segment with Edge and Vicky Guerrero, Kazarni would be quietly dropped from SmackDown, with him being released from WWE soon thereafter. So, yes, it was a pretty unceremonious run for the would-be superstar, but at least it doesn't get any worse than that, surely. Well, that's unless you count one of the biggest failed attempts to repackage someone in WWE history as, despite being notable for playing the hairy tattoo artist Prince Albert in the late 90s and early 2000s, the company would have the balls to try and mind wipe fans on this in 2012 when they brought him back as Lord Tensai. Of course, there was some logic to this though, as after having spent a period of time over in Japan as Giant Bernard where he made quite a name for himself and completely reinvented his character, Vince McMahon felt like he really could do something new with the former Albert upon his re-debut with the company in April of that year. Unfortunately though, when he did make his return as Lord Tensai, a samurai-style warrior, fans would immediately let him know that they remembered exactly who he was, raining down chants of A-Train, Albert, and shave your back on him from there. And this would quickly lead to WWE being forced to acknowledge that yes, this was the former Attitude Era star, with the story then shifting to the idea that, during his time out east, he'd undergone a change of character and returned anew. So with things set in place at that point then, Tensai would go on an impressive early win streak, which saw him pick up victories over the likes of John Cena and then WWE Champion CM Punk. That said, despite there being a real chance to turn him into a main event level heel at this point, it turns out that the boss would get bored of his new toy soon afterwards, as upon losing a rematch to Cena later that spring, Tensai would start going on a losing streak that saw him be defeated by the likes of Sheamus, Randy Orton, Ryback, and Sin Cara. And to make matters worse, after that, he'd be demoted to a comedy act when he was tricked into wearing lingerie for a dance-off segment with Brodus Clay, with him from there actually starting to team with Clay as the two became a regular fixture in the tag division throughout 2013. But despite their best efforts to become tag team champions during this period, they would never be able to do so. And that, ultimately, was part of the reason why, in early 2014, Tensai would retire from in-ring competition altogether. From there, taking up a role in the WWE Performance Center where he remains to this day, now working as their head coach. So even if the Tensai gimmick was a bit of a failure, at least his story got to have a happy ending. And as it happens, he isn't the only trainer currently working in the Performance Center who had to put up with a truly terrible idea in the past, as one of his colleagues, Terry Taylor, would memorably undergo a run as the Red Rooster in the 1980s. Yes, when it comes to bad gimmicks, this one ranks right up there amongst the worst of them as, despite being a very accomplished wrestler on the territory circuit, upon his debut in WWF in 1988, Taylor would morph into the Red Rooster. And this would see him seemingly think he was an actual rooster at times, as wearing all red ring gear, styling his hair like a rooster, and even strutting to the ring like one, he'd create unintentional comedy moments every time he came through the curtain. Hell, even his backstage interview segments weren't safe, because there he'd repeatedly cluck throughout his promos, with this only serving to make things even sillier. So, with things quickly falling down the toilet then, Taylor would change things up when, in early 1989, he'd drop his manager Bobby the Brain Heenan and turn babyface, from there setting about going through every heel on the roster. What this change in alignment didn't fix, however, was that the character was still ridiculous. And so, with fans having none of it, it wasn't long before the Red Rooster had turned into a glorified enhancement talent, one who was regularly used to put over the likes of Mr. Perfect up until the point that he was released from his contract in June of 1990. Of course, as we mentioned before, Terry Taylor would eventually get a chance to come back to WWE and redeem himself, but even if he didn't, it would be hard to blame him for the failure of the Red Rooster gimmick, as we're not sure even Mark Calloway would have gotten that one over. So maybe it's for the best then that it, and all the other failed gimmicks in the video, eventually died, as if nothing else, they can teach us a valuable lesson about the industry. And that's that sometimes, just sometimes, it's best to cut bait when something isn't working. Except for the Shockmaster, that is. We'd pay to see him return any day of the week. Well, guys, what did you think of the video? Let us know in the comments below. Don't forget to smash the like button, subscribe to the channel, as well as follow Wrestle with Andy on Instagram and Twitter. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.